if you weren't here for the uh, first service, you really missed something. The air conditioning system was not working at all, and I'm telling you, it was hot. It's been a long time since I've sweat that much when I preached. And our uh, heating and cooling system is very, very complex and sophisticated. Everything's computerized, high tech. So it takes an extraordinary amount of training and experience to be able to move that switch from heat to cool. <laughs> but somebody finally figured that out, and, it just, and it's much nicer now. <laughs> the last time I uh, stood before you, I was suffering a little bit from the ill effects of a condition called gout, it's kind of a reoccurring thing. It can be painful. It can come on you very quickly, and it can leave almost as quickly. And I'm just delighted to tell you this morning, this is an absolutely pain-free morning for me. And uh, I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I, feel, I feel like David, who said, for by my God, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. I feel like I could do that today. I, uh, I feel like I could leap over a wall, a very short wall, <laughs> in, and, and a very small troop, in all honesty, like a troop of uh, preschoolers or something like that. <laughs> but at my age, I tell you, it just feels great to be able to run and to be able to leap and uh, able to preach to some of the nicest people anywhere. I don't take any of that for granted. Uh, went for my annual checkup this week, and the doctor uh, thankfully said all my numbers were good. Uh, I can die tomorrow, but my numbers will be good. It's, I guess that's important. And uh, my doctor's a Christian, uh, a real Christian, and he, after our discussion about the numbers, he uh, sat back in his chair and relaxed, and he folded his arms, and he said, Now tell me about your sermon this Sunday. So uh, I've already preached it. Uh, I shared with him my text. I gave him my outline, and I, I shared the essence of the message today, the importance of believers being a part of the fellowship. And he shared that there was a time in his life when he he struggled with that issue, that he asked himself the questions, why is church important? Do I really need to attend church? Do I really need to be part of the fellowship? And I think a lot of people have asked similar questions out of sincere hearts. So let's, let's go to the ultimate authority, authority. Let's go to the Word of God. Let's examine the text. It's in Acts chapter 2, and like every text, it has important context. This particular context was the day of Pentecost, which was a Jewish feast. That's a big one, where people from all of the region came to Jerusalem. And it was on this day that Joel's prophecy was fulfilled, and, and the Holy Spirit was poured out. Over 3,000 people heeded people's, uh, Peter's sermon about the resurrected Christ, and they repented of their sins, and they were saved, and the church was born. So what happened to these 3,000 new believers? Did they fall by the wayside, or did they continue to follow Jesus? Well, I think our text provides us with the answer. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, the last verses of Acts, the second chapter, verse 42 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued 
to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So this morning we want to focus on the devotion of these new believers to the fellowship. You'll notice in the NIV that it is, it is called the fellowship, a particular fellowship, a very special fellowship, the fellowship of believers, the fellowship of all those who had heard Peter's message on the day of Pentecost and repented and received the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Now, I believe that we have a pattern here regarding their devotion, what it looked like, how it was fleshed out. And I believe that we should be devoted to the people and principles and practices and priorities to which they were devoted. Our devotion should look a lot like theirs. And I see three words in this text that encapsulate the depth and the degree of their devotion. The first word is the word everyone. Look again, if you would, in verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together. This was extravagant language to describe an extravagant event. Everything about this bears the sign of the miraculous. 3,000 converted on the spot. Wonders and signs verifying the apostolic message. Daily conversions. Jews becoming Christians. That's saying something because the Jews had been led to believe that if you were a child of Abraham, you were covered. You were in. You were safe. But when they heard Peter's message about fulfilled prophecy and the coming of the Messiah and Jesus' life and death and ministry and resurrection, the Holy Spirit did a mighty work of revelation and transformation, and 3,000 were brought into the kingdom. That's our beginning. That's the genesis of the church. It doesn't stop there. In fact, it's only the beginning. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. And somehow there was a spiritual enlightenment, a discernment to know that they needed one another. And this conviction regarding this fellowship was so strong and so compelling, they made it an absolute priority in their lives. Every word and every phrase in this summarization of their new lives reveals the depth and the degree of their newfound devotion to the fellowship. They were all in, and they were all in. Now, I can't imagine a church like that, can you? I mean, it's fun to think about it, a church where all are in, and there's this all in, all out on board, across the board kind of devotion. It's every preacher's dream. I can imagine how powerful and effective and fruitful a church like this would be in ministry. I can't imagine the impact it would have on the world around it. On any given Sunday, we know. We know that we're preaching to the lit and the lukewarm. We're preaching to those who love being at church and those who loathe being at church. We preach to those who would rather be nowhere else and those who would rather be anywhere else. Those who are on the inside and those who are on the outside looking in. And our hope and our prayer and our burden, our passion is that everyone will be in God's army, suited up, ready for action, devoted to the fellowship. Everyone. 
There's another word that gives us an insight regarding the devotion of these new believers, and that's the word everything. Would you note that in verse 44? All the believers were together and had everything in common. Now, some have tried to build a case for communalism or socialism based on this early New Testament practice. In fact, even one of the presidential candidates, who, by the way, frequently and consistently misinterprets and misapplies Scripture, has tried to use this, uh, this portion of Scripture as a foundation for socialism. But the fact is, this was a temporary, isolated practice, apparently never repeated anywhere else by the church, and socialism is certainly never taught in the scriptures. And the fact of the matter is, neither is democracy or monarchy or oligarchy, not even theocracy in the New Testament. The New Testament just doesn't go there. It's got bigger things to talk about. So this response of the church was an answer for the extraordinary circumstances these new believers were facing. You see, we have a biblical context. We also have a cultural or historic context. Many of them were rejected by their families because of their conversion to Christianity. Uh, many of them were not only alienated by their families, but rejected by their friends, their neighbors, their business associates. And they were forced to live in economic hardship. In that day, it cost a lot to become a Christ follower. So they came together and they pooled their resources so they could survive. And the church came through with a splendid display of compassion and kindness and generosity. In verse 45, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Everyone taking care of anyone who had need. I got a text yesterday from Bruce Hochul, and Bruce, Bruce has just undergone knee surgery, a complete knee replacement. He, he said everything went well, but I, I'm in a lot of pain. Pray for me. And Bruce would always get my podium for me before I would teach Sunday school class. And so, just to show him how self-centered I can be, I texted him back and I said, does this mean, Bruce, that I'm going to have to get my own podium in the morning? <laughs> and Bruce said, no, no, I'll come down just before class, I'll bring it over, and then I'll crawl out to our car, <laughs> and I'll take the excruciating trip home. Now, that's devotion, my friend. And I tell you, if there's any way Bruce could have done it and Barb would have allowed it, he would have done it. Devotion. You know, today we too often live in a world where the prevailing attitude is, what's yours is mine and I'll just take it. And what's mine is mine and I'll keep it. But the Spirit-touched church, the grace-filled church, the church devoted to the fellowship lives by the attitude, what is mine is yours, and I'll give it. That's New Testament stuff. That's New Testament Christianity. That's the way the devoted conducted themselves. This was in their DNA. This was the essence of who they are. You can't have the love of God in your heart and keep it to yourself. You can't have His love in your heart and keep it a secret. You can't have the love of God in your heart and see your brother in need and not respond. You can't have His love in your heart and not share the blessings He's given you because love won't let you do that. And love's not mentioned in this text, not one word close to the word love, but it's all over this story, all over. In fact, this is exactly what love looks like. 
When the good doctor reminded me of his struggle and his question, why should I go to church? I, I reminded him it's not just about us. It's about what gift can I bring to others? What investment can I make? What difference can I bring about in the lives of others? Everyone, everything, that's all in. There's a third word that depicts their devotion. Everyone, everything, but then the revealing word every day in verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together and with glad and sincere hearts. Every day, and again, desperate times require desperate measures. The Bible is not teaching that we are under obligation to meet every day any more than it's teaching that we're under obligation to meet in the temple courts. But it's showing us a principle. There is a passion and a priority that existed in the Lord's church and should characterize His church in all places and all times. Something was so valuable in their coming together. The fellowship was so meaningful that they came together every chance they got. You see, the truth is you can get some things here that you will not get out there. You will hear things here that you will never hear out there. What can the world teach you and me about God and faith and hope and love and heaven? What can the world teach us when they don't have God's truth, God's Son, God's Spirit, or God's Word? Every day they continued to meet together. Some of you are thinking, I don't I don't like anybody enough to meet with them every day. <laughs> Even church people annoy me. I know, I know, I understand. Listen, I know I've annoyed my share of people too, and I'm not done doing that in life. It's a gift. I can't make everybody happy. I'm not a jar of Nutella. The church is not perfect. Just get over that. No church is. The Corinthian church had divisions. A couple of ladies in the Philippian church, Sister Prim and Sister Proper, couldn't get along with each other. And not everybody was a big fan of even the Apostle Paul. Oh, what a fellowship. Oh, what joy divine. Well, most of the time, but not all the time. I feel your pain. Do you think I pastored churches for 50 years and loved every minute of every member of every church? Hello? I am Pastor Hawkins, not Saint Hawkins. But God has some answers for us. And right in the midst of that irritation, God is doing a work in us. In fact, using it, that very thing that we resist, to make us his people. He's got an answer for us. He wants us to learn some things. He's got a lot of answers for us, good answers, like grace and love and patience and forgiveness and kindness. And that's really good for us. In fact, that's what he has shown us. Could I get a witness? That's what he has shown us. So pass it on, brother, freely. You have received. Freely give. I believe the devil would attack the very notion of the church. I know he would because he attacks everything that's sacred, everything Jesus loves. I believe he would tell us, you don't need the church. You can do just fine without it. His malevolent metho methodology employs lies and deception. His sinister strategy is divide and conquer. His diabolical design is alienation and isolation. He knows that we are better together than we are apart. One shall turn to flight 
a thousand. Two shall put to flight ten thousand. That's synergism. And that's the church. That's the combined part of the whole being greater than the sum of the individual parts. And it was this holy synergism, this devotion to the fellowship, that gave these people the divine wherewithal to go into all the world and preach the gospel. The divine wherewithal to be the church against which the very gates of hell would not prevail. Everyone, everything, every day. What a picture. What a potential. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for a record uh, not on the fiction shelf, but an accurate depiction of historical reality, the Spirit-filled church blazing a trail, and who would have given them a chance or a prayer? And here we are today because of them. We're so thankful for our heritage, the legacy of the faith walk that has been so powerfully demonstrated before us. And that record calls us. It calls us higher. It calls us deeper. It calls us to unfulfilled potential to have eyes to see what we've never been able to see before, hearts to embrace what we've never been able to embrace, and motives to do what we've never been able to do before. We have a record here, Lord, of victory against the odds, and we're so grateful for that because we live in a day of loud voices, and sometimes it feels like we're being shouted down But we're so thankful today that greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. We're so thankful that the promise given to this church is still applicable to us today, that the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. So I pray that faith will rise in our hearts, optimism will be strong, that each and every one of us will be presented to you, available to you, living sacrifices to you, one after another, until the conglomerate picture is the church triumphant. Lord, as we survey these words, as we weigh them, as we submit ourselves to their inspiration, May the very simple words that we've considered today, everyone, everything, every day, arouse within us a commitment to Christ, a commitment to the gospel, and a commitment to the Lord's body that we've never had before. Even more so as we see the day approaching. And my friends, while your eyes are closed and your heads are bowed for this brief moment, let me ask you, are you in the Lord's church today? And I don't mean have you signed a role, were you born into the church? I mean, have you been born again and brought into the Lord's living church? I'm not talking about a denomination. God forbid. It is so much bigger and better than that. I'm talking about what is known as the invisible church, the church universal. It is made up of believers everywhere, anywhere, made up of believers of all time. And some of those believers are even in heaven right now. That's the true Lord's church. And there's only one way, there's only one access to that church. Good works will never get you in. You can stand at the door all day and knock, but it won't be open based on the virtue of good works. You can climb the moral ladder all you want, as many rungs of the ladder as you can. You get to the top, it's leaning against the wrong building. No, there's only one way into the Lord's church, 
And it's the Lord of the church. It's the one who said, I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And if you've never made that commitment to Christ, you can do that today, and it's a beautiful, life-changing thing. And if you've never made that commitment, why not today? In fact, the Bible urges us and says today is the day. Now is the acceptable time. And when you do that, things are moved into motion. Here on earth, your heart and your mind will be changed, transformed. You will become a new creation in Christ. You will have a new capacity and a new desire to serve Him and follow Him. And things are moved in heaven because your name will be written down in the Lamb's book of life and the angels of God will rejoice. And it's all up to you. And you can make that decision and that commitment and it will be a new beginning for you. There's just one way. Will you come God's way today? Would you stand with me, congregation? If you have made that commitment, if that's your heart's desire, you can make that commitment right now. I want you to do that. Then you stop on your way out at the desk, immediately by the center door, and there'll be some assistance for you, some literature on direction to help you in your new spiritual life.